Welcome to Weddings Unveiled, the podcast designed to help you build a productive, profitable wedding or event business. Here's your host, Angela Profit. Hi, y'all. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of Weddings Unveiled professional tips and secrets on wedding planning and event design, where we take you behind the scenes of our past experiences in the industry and share with you what we have learned from them and how they have made us stronger. This podcast will help you grow a productive and profitable business to launch you into success within the hospitality industry. Before we get started, I want to ask you something. Are you looking for a community of professionals that are looking to share, learn, and grow where you can talk openly and freely about the highs and lows in your business? If so, I want to invite you to check out my inner circle at AngelaProfit.com slash membership. Hi, y'all. It's Angela Prophet, and thank you so much for tuning in to Weddings Unveiled today. I'm so excited to be talking to Leah Weinberg, who's going to be sharing their unique experience on what they're doing in the wedding and events industry. Leah, welcome, and thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yay! Well, so tell our listeners what your company is and how you got into this industry. Yes. So my company is ColourPop Events. I'm based in New York City. I do mostly weddings, but do a little bit of corporate and nonprofit work. And I have a bit of an interesting story as to how I got into this. So I was a commercial real estate attorney for quite a long time. To make a very long story short, it became very evident quickly that I was not meant to, that being, I shouldn't say that I wasn't meant to be a lawyer because I was very, admittedly very good at what I did, but I did not enjoy it. So that became quickly obvious. And I knew I wanted to run my own business and was always brainstorming lots of different ideas. And event planning was something that kind of kept popping up as a possibility on multiple occasions because I felt like it was a really great fit for my strengths in terms of the level of like organization that it requires, the sort of project management aspect of it, but it also was going to provide a little bit of a creative outlet. So in 2012, I planned my own wedding and found it to be a rather kind of easy and fun process, which I know is not what happens with a lot of people. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to start. I've been thinking about doing this for a while and had a positive experience doing it for myself, though I will admit that I did have a month of coordinator for my wedding because I knew better. Um, (laughs) But I slowly started taking steps to get the company off the ground. And I would say a little bit more than a year after I got married was when I did my first official wedding as ColourPop Events. That's awesome. Well, I love your take on it because... A lot of us that get into this industry, it's a complete accident. Mm -hmm. And most people start with either doing their own wedding and they're like, I got this, I can do this. But then having the experience of also the attorney background and I mean, you know, right from wrong, but you know, having that creative outlet is just like the perfect combination to know, like usually how to handle people and then how to be creative too. So yeah. Yeah, for sure. And while I did not enjoy being an attorney, I will say that there's a ton of transferable skills that really kind of set me up for success in terms of being an event planner. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't agree more like that. People ask me, they're like, well, what makes you so different from any other planner and design? And I'm like, you know, honestly, from going to school to be a psychologist and working in a mental hospital, (laughs) you learn about people and you never know what's going on with someone. And so it taught me to be patient. And so while I hated like my role in a psych ward, Mm -hmm. um, like you just said, it completely set me up for understanding like how to handle some of these people when brats are like, my mom's crazy. And I'm like, wait, so 
is she driving you crazy? Or is she like <laughs> really crazy with a chart, like a, like on medicine? Yeah. <laughs> it's like two different things. Um, and so I'm assuming that you're no longer practicing law at all. I mean, I'm not. Yeah. I've been law free for about two and a half years, <laughs> as I like to say it. And I've, and I've had my company for just about five full years. Okay. And do you still have friends or people in the industry that come to you and ask you all these laws and attorney questions? <laughs> um, yes, quite a bit. Um, some people I'm able to like just help out and give advice to. Um, I did commercial real estate. So like if people have like landlord tenant stuff, I get asked yeah. about that a lot or like, can you take a look at my lease? I've had people ask for help in other areas that I am nowhere, anywhere near qualified to do. So in those cases, I will direct them to somebody who actually has experience in the area that they need. Yeah. There's a guy I was speaking at, I believe it was with the wedding market news mm -hmm. and he's an attorney, but he specifically works for wedding professionals. Mm hmm but he focuses specifically on helping industry professionals, like making mm -hmm. sure that their contracts are really, really nailed and buttoned up. It only takes one time for somebody to not have their contract in place. Yeah. And then it's like, okay, I need to change this. Or even, yeah. So even like certain provisions. So I'm constantly adding to my contract. Uh -huh. um, the thing that happened recently that comes to mind where like I just wasn't protected because I never really anticipated this was I was contacted by a couple who was like, we're getting married in, we want to get married in New York. We are looking, our decision is down to like these two venues. We want to hire you for full planning. So they hired me and I started running budget numbers for them and they were kind of seeing how they had a very healthy budget, but they were also having a 250 person wedding. Mm -hmm. So they were quickly seeing how their money was like not going to get them as far as they wanted here in New York. And mm -hmm. so one day they're randomly like, oh, we're now going to consider getting married in New Orleans. We're <laughs> going to look into that. So at first I was like, oh, okay, fine. You know, like keep me posted. We can figure out how we might be able to make that work. But then ultimately they came back and they were like, we're getting married in New Orleans. And I was just like, I had to think about it and be very realistic. And I was like, I'm just not, I don't do destination work. I'm not interested in doing destination work. So I was just like, that is not going to be a great fit for me. So yeah. because my contract didn't deal with it and because one of the partners was also an attorney as well, I knew that like it could get contentious if I yeah. tried to keep their deposit without my contract allowing me to do that. So I basically, we agreed on like me keeping a certain portion of the deposit for hours worked because I had like done a budget for them, researched been to venue visits with them, done some research and stuff. And then I had to come out of pocket for a lot of money, like money that mm. had already been spent. So like, um, yeah. so now my contract says that if I'm doing full planning for you and you don't have a venue yet, if you decide to get married outside of New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, or Pennsylvania, then um, I get to terminate your contract and keep your money. Yeah. Well, but that was a tough lesson learned. That right? was a very painful check to have to write back to them. Yeah. Like same, same thing with me. I mean, I've been in court, not because of, I initiated it, but, but because there was an issue with payment and vendors have sued people. I've been subpoenaed to court and mm -hmm. we are constantly updating things. Just like you said, like the, my, yeah. my very first time in court, I learned in the Tennessee laws and I know they're different for every state. But in Tennessee, if you use the word in your contract, retainer instead of deposit, you know, retainer means non-refundable period. Yep. <laughs> and, um, and that's another reason, like we actually several years ago went to a different model where, you know, we take that retainer, that deposit up front, it's non-refundable and that covers the first 20 hours. And then we bill the first of every month. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, none of, none of that money is refundable period yeah. because yeah. it's the time that's already, like you said, I mean, the, the time's already spent. Right. Um, and that's another reason that it taught me to track my time. And so that clients could see, 
I'm like, well, you know, half the time is spent behind the scenes where we're working with vendors and we're taking things, we're taking care of things behind the scenes on behalf of you. That's why you're hiring us. Yeah. (laughs) So yeah, it's just, um, it's unfortunate, but I'm, I'm actually very thankful that those things happened kind of early on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Better to learn them early than to like really have it be a big thing later on. Yeah. So prior to getting into your business, like around five years ago, and then being going to law school and being an attorney, were you, were you the girl where all of your friends said, will you help me? Or you just really enjoyed doing your own, your own wedding and then having that coordinator help you. Was that really your first experience in like, Oh yeah. I can do this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was not, so I know, I know a lot of people who like love to throw parties and are always planning things. That was not me at all. I mean, I was, I've always been like a very detail oriented person and like good at planning things, but like, I wasn't always hosting like dinner parties or entertaining that kind of thing. Like planning my wedding was really the first foray into planning an event for me. That's awesome. And I love how it opened up like a whole new career door for you. Yeah. That's- it's bizarre. Like I never, if you had told, if you had told me when I was little that I was going to grow up to be a wedding planner, mm-hmm. I would not have believed you. Um, but I think like for me, it's more, it's not so much about the weddings. Like I like weddings. I'm not one of those people that like absolutely is obsessed with weddings. I personally just love running a business. Yeah. And so what wedding and event planning is just happens to be the type of business that I'm working on at the moment. Um, But I just love being a business owner more than anything. That's awesome because so many people in this industry, um, in fact, that's one of my passions is trying to help the creative industry understand the business side of things Mm -hmm. because most of us that are creative, we don't know the business and I was that girl years ago. I didn't understand. Like I was just doing it and I was having fun and I was helping people and I was doing all these pretty things. <laughs> and then I got a, a, into this business group, this entrepreneur group. And every year we get a new coach and one of my coaches, I mean, he was just a hard ass mm-hmm. and he's like, how are you making money? And what are you doing with your time? And are you intentional? And what's your goal? And blah, blah. And I'm like, oh my God, I don't know. Like, I don't ever think yeah. of these things. <laughs> and, um, but it taught me to be a, a very smart business owner, but that doesn't come natural. No, most people and some people don't love it either. They really could not stand like, I mean, I'm such a nerd and I love numbers and I love doing like the accounting portion of it and like reconciling my taxes at the end of every month. Um, And I know I'm not in the majority on that one. Right. No, like I have you ever done um, a personality assessment? Yes. Have you done true colors before? I don't think so. I haven't heard of that one. So that's the one that we use in um, in my company, like to hire interns and team members and vendors. We Now we do with our clients too. It's just fun. And so there's like four different colors and four different personalities. And so green people are super analytical. They love numbers. They're really, they run businesses really, really well. They work a, they they can work alone and independently and get mm-hmm. things done. And they, they like that. And then, and typically they're like lawyers and accountants and a lot of doctors because they love to research and they, they just, they love that. So I'm sure you're high green. And yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah. And then like blue people are very sensitive. Like if everybody around them has to be happy and they're happy. And then, um, gold is like very type a, very deadline oriented. They need a routine. Um, they're very loyal to an organization and then you have orange, which is like your typical wedding industry professional. That's like just going by the seat of their pants. They need to be doing something different (laughs) every day. They're super entrepreneurial, but they're not good with running things and they're not good with numbers. And so I'm super hot orange. However, I have learned that if I don't instill green or hire people to do it for me, yep. that mm-hmm. I might as well go work at Apple and get a job. Because <laughs> <laughs> there, it is an art to running a business. Yeah, it for sure. It really is. 
Um, so what would you say is special slash unique about what you offer? Like if clients are like, well, what's different from what you do to what, you know, other planners do? Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of it is my background. I do, I tend to attract a lot of attorneys, doctors, people in finance. I think because they, we just kind of get each other's vibe. They really appreciate my responsiveness. I totally understand like, you know, what their professions are like and the time constraints and, and lack of time to plan a wedding on their part. Um, and I think also it's my availability. And so, I mean, this is sort of like to a fault and not drawing boundaries, but I'm pretty available to my clients. I've definitely had situations where like a bride was just getting a little, getting stressed over stuff like with family. And she's like, I really just need to like meet with you to talk through this and to like vent. And so pretty much I just met her for coffee one day and like listened to her for an hour and gave her some advice and she felt a lot better. But, um, I definitely know other planners who like taking an, un, an unsolicited and unplanned coffee date just to listen to a client vent is like not part of what they would do. And so I try to do maybe like 15 to 20 weddings per year, mm -hmm. um, which allows me to be able to like spend that time with my couples and getting to know them and being available for them. Like when they, when they really need it. That's amazing. It, you know, it's funny because that's, I realized that, Oh, like 12 years in my business. <laughs> um, in fact, I just wrote a whole educational program for people who are doing over a hundred events a year, mm. challenging them and saying, are you really making money? Like, why are you doing this? Because I know when I was doing it, I, I mean, it about killed me physically and mentally. Yeah, I have, that's I mean, a lot. It was so much. Now I have a team and I have help, but as you know, as a business owner, half the time when something is wrong, everybody wants to talk to the owner. They don't want to talk to the operations manager or anything. And so finally, I'm like, there has to be a better way. And so that's when I got this other coach and they started to teach me about, let's focus on doing, that's exactly what he said. He's like, no more than 20, 10 to 20. And mm -hmm. let's take full experience and the opportunity to take care of these families instead yep. of just half ass, like, helping people who really don't need the full experience, like just right. offer that and focus, pre-qualify the hell out of your people and yep. make sure they're a good fit. And it's hilarious that you said, like you take care of most of the people who you get each other. Mm -hmm. And so what I've learned in clarifying this process, and you know, it, it took about two years because we book out 15 right. months, 12, 15, 18 months in advance sometimes. Um, and so if, if you make a change, it's funny because we're talking about redoing our contracts. If you make a change to your contract, it's like, oh my God, I've got 120 of these things with the old contract. Mm -hmm. And then it's just, you're sick to your stomach. <laughs> and so I, I finally, like, I get it. And the crazy thing is because this coach was just so like track, 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 track. And then he's like, if you don't do this, I'm going to fire you. I'm like, you can fire a mentor. Like what? <laughs> and of course I didn't want that. And so, um, it taught me so much. It was like a punch in my heart when he's like, look at how many weddings you not only did for free, you lost money and you basically paid these people to do their event because mm -hmm. you didn't charge appropriately. You're paying these people to help and mm -hmm. you, you didn't bill them for all these expenses like their food and their water and all these last minute things that you went and, went and picked up for people on Saturday morning. Like, I mean, that's like 12, one year it was $12,000 in expenses. He's like, oh my God, Angela, you have to. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And so, it, but it's things like that where now it's much, much easier to look at a client and say, no, this is not a good fit. Right. <laughs> um, and it is exactly what you just said. It has a, now allowed me to focus more on the people who do want somebody, you know, who's there. And so when we talk about our pricing model and someone's like, oh my God, that like, that's so expensive. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, no, I mean, would you work full time? 
for a year for someone for twenty right. or thirty thousand dollars and then pay taxes and pay overhead and pay staff and pay insurance and you know and it's like when you educate them they're like oh well I didn't look at it that way <laughs> yeah like well just because it's fun it, it it doesn't mean it's not a business yeah and that's one of the things in our industry that is just lacking so much um that that yeah. I really really learned so it sounds like you attract the people that appreciate like your personality and it's like yes. I attract all the orange people <laughs> <laughs> and like the word deadline is not in the ver their vocabulary. And mm. so like my right hand, she's super gold. So, you know, opposites attract and it, it balances the company out. And she's like, oh my God, if they just don't get back to us. And it's like, eh, if not, like, we'll just pull it off ourselves. <laughs> but different things stress different people out. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say? Like, are there other things where your clients, like, I'm sure they love that you can relate to them, but are there other specific things that your clients are just like, oh my God, I could have never have done this without you? I mean, I think just in general, they appreciate, again, like the availability and the responsiveness, but also my just approach to come at things from a very logical way. Um, so like there's definitely times where couples will like fixate on an issue and they'll kind of go down the rabbit hole with it themselves. And then they talk to me and I kind of help give them, I help tell them to like, take a breath, take a step back, like look at the issue and, um, you know, just approach it in like a more logical and like step-by-step -step way. For example, I had a couple last night who were trying to find a venue for their reception and they're kind of going back and forth on different ideas. And I could tell in some of the emails that I got that they're just like questioning things and not sure what to do and all this other stuff. And so last night we, I, we had a call and I kind of talked to them about the venue that's their front runner. Um, but they want to, it's going to be like a winter reception. So one of the things, and it's a newer venue. So we're waiting to find out from them on tenting because they're thinking of putting up, a like a permanent tent for the winter in their back their like backyard area. Yeah. Um, but we don't know yet whether that's going to happen. And so, um, the couple was like, well, what happens if that doesn't work out? What are we going to do? And I'm like, no, we're going to just say like, I'm meeting with these people actually today. It just so happens. Yeah. So I was like, let me meet with them. I'm going to ask them, try to tell, like, I'm going to tell the venue that like, you're super interested and that this is like, a, and if they could work it out, like you're most likely going to use them and just try to find out when they'll know about the tent. And, and then we'll go from there. Like, yeah. don't try to like, try to start thinking about other venue possibilities until we've heard from this one and know that it's not going to work because right. that just, that's just a waste of like your and like your emotional energy, but also your time and energy. Um, and I woke up to an email from them and they're like, we always feel so much better after Aww. talking. To you, so thank you. Um, so yeah, I think it's like just helping my couples like be realistic, approach things in like a very regimented way so that they're not just like not having like emotions and ideas and brainstorming stuff, just snowballing. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's like, no matter what personality people are, it's, it's like, um, adults truly do turn into children sometimes. I mean, I don't yeah. mean that in a mean way, <laughs> but it's like, I try to be funny with people. I'm super sarcastic. And so I'll be like, okay, so today we're going to potty train your brain and <laughs> <laughs> we're going to do some things a little bit differently. And, um, yeah. So it's like, sometimes you just have to talk people down off the ledge. Yeah. And it's yeah. And I mean, it's funny, like I'm guilty of it too in my own life, but I catch myself. So like, I'll be talking to my husband and I'll like start with one thought and they then say something else and then go to something and then like start to like, you could say it like he, you could tell I'm getting excited. And then I'm just like, okay, wait a second. All right slow down let's take this one thing at a time but it's like just how my brain works sometimes too or like I get it like there's so many things coming at you and you want to get it all out but then you gotta like take a breath and 
go forward, like step by step. Yep. Yeah. So this is like, this is not a question that I is like on the sheet, but I just wonder like, how did you come up with like color pop events and your logo? Cause it's so fun and it's so unique and your website is beautiful. And I'm just wondering like, what was your inspiration for that? Um, it's funny because I actually had a different company name that I wanted to use, but it ended up being too close to somebody else's. And I remember I asked a friend of mine who does intellectual property law, I was like, what do you think about, you know, the similarity between this proposed name and this other person's name? And then quickly realized that if I had to ask that question, it's not something I want to even get right. involved in. Like, there's just no point in even thinking about something that's relatively close to somebody else's. So I went back to the drawing board. Um, my original name was like sort of music inspired because music has been really important to me throughout my life. Um, so I tried to find something else music inspired. I was like going down my iTunes catalog, like looking at band names and song names and album names and didn't really come up with anything. And then um, I thought of the term pop of color and I was like, that's a little bit too wordy, but what about color pop? Um, and then here we are. Yeah. So I worked with a designer, um, for the logo. I just really wanted something simple. Um, I knew like I had a Pinterest board where I was looking at different color palettes. So, um, I kind of really gravitated towards like the pink and purple. And then in some places there's also a little bit of gold in there too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've always just responded. So I'm a very, I have always like responded to color. Like it just sort of wakes up my senses and mm -hmm. um, I love it. Like I remember growing up, we had a big orange wall in my house and people thought we were um, crazy for that. We actually had to paint it over. We had to paint over it before my parents sold that at the house that I grew up in because like nobody was going to buy it with a big orange wall. <laughs> um, but like my, my parent, my dad's also super into color. So it's just like always around a lot of like bold, vibrant colors and always just have like a physical reaction to it. So it was kind of perfect. Um, and it fit me. Like I've changed nothing. Like I've always been a super colorful person and worn tons of like really colorful stuff. And so I happened to just accidentally fall into this brand that perfectly fit with who I am already. So I didn't have to do a ton of work to like create a brand. It was just very much an extension of me. That's so cool. I love yeah. like some people have a brand story and you know, how'd you come up with it? And some people don't. So yeah, I just, I love like, it's such a, your logo is so fun and everything like it's happy. It's like you go yeah. to the homepage, your website, it's like happy. So do your couples, do you find that in their design and their aesthetics, do you get the opportunity to ever do like all white weddings or you're like, that's not me. I really don't want to do that. And so the couples that you draw in, like they like that color and the happiness. It's actually a mix. Um, because I do just strictly planning. I don't do, I mean, I, I consult on event design. I tell couples like I'm the creative director of your yeah. wedding. So I'll help take your ideas and refine them, but I'm not doing the designing for them. So some of my couples, I've had one couple that did a rainbow wedding, which of course is like my ultimate dream. Yeah. And then I've had other couples that do more neutral stuff. And it's really funny when, when I'm talking to like somebody over the phone for the first time and they're like, well, we don't really want something super colorful. Is that a problem? And I'm like, <laughs> it's not a problem at all. Like I'm just planning your wedding. So like, I kind of don't care what it looks like. I mean, I still obviously attract couples with a certain aesthetic. So like the big ballroom weddings with huge floral centerpieces and like thing crystals hanging, that's not my cup. That's like not my couple at all. And that's not my aesthetic. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think like sort of, we all, they all sort of kind of like the same type of flowers, like the sort of more like wild and organic arrangements, but the color preferences of people definitely vary. And then sometimes it's great. They'll come to me and be like, we want to add just like a pop of color to it. And they kind of consult with me on like the best way to bring in something bold without having it like take over their whole wedding. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's just when you're like thinking about the name of your business and like your logo and it's, sometimes you just wonder like, what does the outside world think? 
And so I could see people contact me and being like, does, does it have to be colorful? Right. Exactly. <laughs> so, but again, it's like, you want to pull in the people that you want to work with. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I totally get it. W- like, would you, what are your biggest, like right now, I know that your, your business, um, is around five years old. So like, Pinterest has been around probably when you first started. Mm-hmm. Um, like for me, the biggest challenge is just because social media wasn't around when I started. And so just yeah. keeping up and like educating people who bring Pinterest boards and they're like, I want this, but I want to spend this much money. It's like, well, uh, we're going to have to meet in the middle here. Yeah. Um, but what would you say for you and like being in New York and that may not the location may not have anything to do with it, but what are some of the challenges that you feel that our industry is facing? And then what are some challenges that you could say that you, the the business is facing? Yeah. I mean, I think that that challenge of couples kind of coming in with a vision for their wedding and not understanding costs. I mean, even just beyond flowers and stuff, like I, as much information as there is on the internet, it's not always accurate in terms of budgets because partly mm-hmm. because it, it varies, it varies by every single location. So like a New York city wedding is going to cost a different amount than like a Hudson Valley, New York wedding yep. or even further upstate or like, you know, New York versus New Jersey. So I think just by virtue of the fact that it does differ, that's why it's kind of impossible for there to be precisely accurate information on the internet. Um, but like just couples that come with like a real, like just a, like initial inquiries where they kind of tell me what their proposed budget is. And then they're like, but we're inviting such and such amount of guests and we really want a band. And then I kind of have to share with them that like a band in New York is going to cost over $10,000 versus if you get a DJ, it can be under 2000. Yeah. Um, and people just, so it's like a lot of setting expectations. Unfortunately, sometimes it's bursting bubbles, Mm -hmm. which, you know, I try not to do. And a lot of times, like sometimes if couples come with smaller budgets and like unrealistic expectations, Um, I just say that I'm not available. Like I, I never want to make somebody feel bad based on their budget. So I can want, if I'm able to like suss that out in advance, then I usually just kind of say that I'm not available. And I know some people talk about like wanting to do the education and like wanting to explain how much a planner should cost or like how much a month of or day of coordinator should cost. Um, but I, but I also just don't want to make some people feel that if they don't have a ton of money to spend. So I feel like right. it's sometimes easier um, to just kind of pass on it than to like really take a deep dive in with everybody right. and explain it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know where, um, I'll never forget. I was actually in New York teaching a class with a company called IWED and the Institute of Wedding and Event Design. And that was the day that the Knot had published like the, they do it annually, like oh, average yeah, budgets. Oh, yeah. Oh, and I'm like, so I was in the middle of a class, which that, that it was like a workshop. It was like three hours straight. And I, I mean, I'm not going to look at my phone. I mean, I'm busy and I get done teaching. I had all these notifications and all these texts <laughs> from vendors and clients. And yep. there was something I'll never forget, like these clients and, you know, like voicemails and they're like, we just saw this on social media that the average blah, 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 blah. And so I, t- I t- like sat down and put a response together and, you know, you take the emotions out of it and they say no more than five sentences. <laughs> and yeah. um, I'm like, number one, I'm your planner and your designer and I'm not average. So you're Wait, not having so an average wedding. <laughs> did you have, did you have clients that like saw that and yeah. contacted you because they felt like they were overpaying? Yep. That's oh, exactly that's what it did. Terrible. And so oh, I was no. like, number one, I don't do, I, I create from a psychological angle, I create an experience for your guests. And if you want that experience, depending on if it's in Nashville, New York, LA, we do, that's most, we do a lot of destination, destination weddings. That's, mm-hmm. I do more of that now than I do in Nashville. And so it's so different. 
And so I'm like, that's the first thing. You're not having an average wedding. So let's mm -hmm. be honest. The second thing is I want you to ask these questions when you're looking at that survey. How many guests are there? Is it evening? Is it daytime? Is it a band? Is, is it a DJ? Is it open bar? Is it wine or beer and signature drink? Are they having a $20,000 hors d'oeuvres party prior to mm -hmm. their seated dinner that is a dual entree with a, an intricate seating chart with menu cards and place cards and escort cards? And, you know, do they have this band and, and do they have an after hours DJ? And so I'm like, you, they, they don't understand that what the not saying, oh, your average wedding is $32,000. I'm like, okay, I've, I've been, I've been in the industry a long time. I don't think I've ever done a wedding for that amount, not for two yeah. or 300 people with an open oh, bar no. and a band. Yeah. So I'm like the fact that it doesn't give specifics, it mm -hmm. just kills me, Yeah. And, but it has created so much almost distrust from clients who read that bullshit. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, listen, I'm all about education. Like that's what 50% of my job is to educate you on how to spend your money based on what's important to you. And so, yeah, it's like these things. I'm like, where are you getting your freaking information? <laughs> yeah. But it is such a challenge. And every year it gets it gets, um, I don't want to say worse, but it gets more challenging where now, I don't know about you, but like, I feel like I'm building a house, literally building a house and taking it down in 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Like, and the last time I was in New York, I was coaching a girl up there and I was trying to help her be more productive in her processes. And so I was just shadowing her. And first off, she didn't have a car. She did all this stuff like on the subway with this big cart. And I'm like, I was just shocked. I'm like, wait, I don't understand. Like you, this is how you get your stuff to these venues. And then we, it was at a hotel. It, it was a really nice place though. And we go there and I'm like, well, where's the vendor room? <laughs> and they're like, a what? I'm like, like our storage room, like where the boxes and purses and like, where is that? And they're like, Oh no, you, we just have to put everything under tables here. Like we don't. Oh yeah. Have yeah. No, room. that doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, wait, what? And so like in Nashville, you know, if you are at the Omni or the West, you know, wherever it's like, we typically have three little breakout rooms where it's like, this is the planners area. This is the floral area. This is the lighting area. Oh, and I goodness. started to learn how planners and designers in New York, everything is so different. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wow, this is harder, way harder than like, I'm like, I don't think I could, would ever do it. Like, like, I don't think I would do yeah. this. So how do you like being in New York and like with it just continuously growing with more and more people, like, how do you navigate that? Um, I mean, it's just kind you just kind of go with the flow. I mean, I fortunately don't know any different. So like, yeah. I don't have your experience where like you've done them in Nashville and then come here and it like looks like a whole different animal. Like we just kind of learn to navigate it that way. Um, you'll hear stories about people that like get stuck on a subway before on their way to a wedding or something. Yeah. And so because of that, like I just make sure I get like a lift to weddings and stuff. So obviously that adds like a little bit of an extra expense. Um, but yeah, you just kind of go with the flow. I personally, like if I could work at the same three or four venues every year, like mm -hmm. I would, I don't have a need for like variety and changing things up because like once I know a place and have a good rapport with them and know the flow like that, I think is priceless here. If you're a planner or designer and you're constantly having to work at new venues, mm -hmm. um, I think that adds a lot of, of wear and tear because you're having to like learn, learn all the ins and outs. And I know that that applies in other places too, but I think in New York, it can be a little bit more challenging because we all the spaces are so different um like there's one place that has such a tiny kitchen that caterers depending on the size of the event have to like plate out on the sidewalk in front of the <laughs> oh building. my god yeah 
And regardless, they're doing Sanit out on the sidewalk in front of the building. Um, so yeah, so like each place has its own different thing. And so I feel like if you're having to mix it up a ton, then you're constant. I mean, it's great. You're getting a lot of experience and constantly learning new venues and stuff. Um, but for me, I just love kind of working at the same places because you get into a real groove and like really get to know those places in and out. Yeah, like... Oh my, is that even like, does the health <laughs> Sanit- is that sanitary? I, I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> Probably I... not. I don't know. Oh um, my gosh. Yeah. I was at, um, so in, how far are you from Albany? Um, probably like what, four or five hours, maybe, maybe six okay. hours. So I did a wedding a couple of years ago in Albany and I I got to know this design company there and just loved them. And I kept coming up there and like working with them. And there were several venues that, I mean, they do a lot of weddings in a weekend. Mm -hmm. And, and this, this guy like knows that I'm like, you know, I'm a planner. I'm super, super particular about everything being perfect. Mm -hmm. And, um, and since he had worked, had this experience with me, he kind of knew how my brain worked. And so there was this one country club. It was maybe in Saratoga. I can't, it was like around that area. And um, he's like, now listen, they do nine weddings a day, typically. He's oh, like, my goodness. all these different rooms. He's like, do not go in there and tell those people how to do it. And um, he's like, I just need you to go in there and set the linens up and steam them and um, set up the flowers and light the candles and leave. And so, which that's what a designer does. However, we plan and design. (laughs) So I just, I, I I was completely like, oh my God. Like I saw the behind the scenes and how they were. I'm like, you know, I think that it would be a wonderful investment for this venue. If you guys like put your floors on like this switch. So you like, you turn it on and the floor moves and like the tables come in and then they go out. I mean, it was just like a revolving door. It was crazy. And I'll never forget going in and I'm like, okay, these tables were preset, but, and then there were stacks and racks and sheets of food, like right in the middle of all this craziness. And I'm like, this is disgusting. <laughs> like, yeah. I wonder if people know the behind the scenes of that. And at the time, this was years ago, kind of before like social media was like really, really prevalent. Mm-hmm. Now I feel like people would take pictures of that and be like, look at the madness and the craziness and look at yeah. the pretty. But it's yeah, just- like if they had a planner, I mean, I know I can say I would never recommend a couple do anything at a venue that's churning out that many in a right? day. Right. Like they just, they can't, again, it goes back to volume. Like there is no way that they're executing those to the best of their abilities. Yep. Just no way. I just, I went in, I did go in there though. And I totally made friends with all the servers who (laughs) barely spoke English. And I'm just like, okay, so let's not put the salt and pepper shakers down yet. And let's not put sugar caddies down and let's bring it out upon request because they spend a lot of money on flowers and linens and I want the tables to be really pretty. And the guy that hired, he's like, I cannot believe they listened to you. And I'm like, I think it's just, they're so used to people coming at like people being rude to them. And Mm -hmm. it's like, if you're nice to people, it kind of goes a long way. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, for sure. So, um, it's just a different world. And I don't think people realize that. Do most of your couples live in New York or are, are any of them just coming there to get married? No, most of my couples are, are local. They live gotcha. here. Okay. Yeah. So they know like just how it is pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. That's all. And I'll, t- and I'll talk to them a lot about the difference between like going with a raw space or going with a a venue that does have, um, like everything in house and the pros and cons of that kind of stuff. Um, there's just like, there's a ton to choose from here. So you get like the really cool hip, like raw Brooklyn spaces. You've got museums that do events. You've got the hotels that do events. You've got restaurants that do events. So it's like, I mean, it's, I feel like it can be and I often get told this when people inquire with me, but it's a really overwhelming process Yeah, in New York. And particularly when you don't have information that helps you get clarity 
on budget. Um, Cause like people will be telling me that they're looking at these certain venues and I know that they have like outrageous, just venue fees, like nothing yeah. else included. And then they tell me their budget and I'm like, there's no way that you're going to make that work with that budget. So some people, I feel like, unfortunately, if they don't have a planner, they get just stuck because they see a venue that they like, they spend money on it, not realizing what's got to go into it. And I feel like that happens a lot with some of these like Hudson Valley venues that are more just like open, like private estate properties or like farms and things like that. Like people are like, Oh, this is a beautiful backdrop, but, um, we didn't know what was going in. I had one. So one of my couples said that to me, they're like, had we known what it was going to take to plan our wedding at this, um, like farm, they're like, we would never have done it. Yeah. We wouldn't, we wouldn't have picked this venue over again. And so I think like, that's the biggest, one of the biggest selling points for people to hire a planner from the beginning is we're trained. Like we can yep. go into a space and we're like, okay, you're going to need tent dance floor, bathrooms, electricity, the caterer is going to have to create, like build a kitchen under a small tent on mm -hmm. site. You're probably going to have to have dumpsters, transportation, golf carts to like move things around across this giant piece of property. And like a couple, I mean, and it's no fault on their part. This is the first time they've done it. Um, but they're not going to know all that stuff. And some venues aren't going to be forthcoming and tell you all that stuff nope. either. No. Nope. Yeah. And that's one thing. I don't know if you get this. I get this a lot where they fall in love with the venue person and the venue person recommends planners because they're not the planner. Mm -hmm. And then I'll, you know, talk to people. They think they're interviewing me. I'm kind of interviewing them. And they're like, well, I just love so-and-so. And I mean, they can help me out here and here and here. So I really just need you for da 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 da, -da. And I'm like, mm -hmm. oh no, that's not what the venue person does. And by the way, they work for the venue. So yep. it's somewhat of a revolving door, especially during busy season. Yeah. So like I work for you. I don't work for any, any of these venues. So I'm looking out for you. I mean, yeah. you, you almost in this day and time, if you don't have a planner to navigate things for you, like, I just don't know how people do it anymore. <laughs> it's yeah. so overwhelming. <laughs> yeah. So I had a very fascinating situation. My best friend from law school got married in St. Louis and she hired a planner. Um, but the planner agreed actually not to be there the day of huh? because they said the venue person was so hands-on, I guess. And I don't know if, I don't know if it ultimately was like a budget thing though. I can't hmm. imagine it really was, but like, First, okay, number one, how a planner can be like, I'm going to help you plan and then I'm not going to show up on the day of like, no, this no. is my, ba this is my baby. I'm seeing this through till the yes. end. But number two, the venue person, as you have just so eloquently pointed out is there for the venue. And so like, I ended up having to step in oh my God. and do more like day of coordination than I anticipated because of course like the venue events person is in the back in the kitchen checking on the timing of food like they're not just sort of standing and overseeing everything no. um, and it's so frustrating and a lot of places here that have in-house events people actually tell couples not to hire a planner mm -hmm. um, and I find that particularly frustrating mm -hmm. but at the same time if somebody's saying that then like I don't want to be in there anyway because no. they're not they're not going to be nice to me. And I've had some events, in-house events, people not be nice to me and it is miserable. So yep. it's like, if, if you're a venue and you're telling, encouraging people not to hire a planner, um, well, number one, I'm really probably not going to ever recommend you. Right. <laughs> but A, but B, if I get an inquiry for that place, like I'm definitely going to think twice before taking this on because like, I don't want a negative experience on the day of the wedding either. Yeah. And a lot of venues in Nashville that have taken on this model of one-stop shop, they tell the couples that they have everything in house and blah, 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 blah. Well, they don't mm -hmm. and they rent it. They mark it up 30%. And the reason they don't want a planner in there is because they take, or, I mean, I've literally been told this by people. They're like, Oh, the things you do are so beautiful, but no, we, we don't recommend planners because it takes money away from the bottom line. And I'm like, Ooh. that's such a selfish thing to say because 
you should be planning for the couple. It's, I mean, yeah, there's nothing cheap about a wedding, no matter where it is, but the fact that it's all about numbers to these people, it just, I mean, again, it's a business. I get it. But if you need 20 grand to run your venue, pay the bills and the overhead and make a profit and pay your staff, fine, but don't mark everything up and then take advantage of people and lie. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what they're doing. And yeah. it's just, it's sickening. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, so I guess that could be a challenge everywhere, like not just where mm-hmm. I live. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, these but, in-house events people. But anyway, what is the next best thing coming up? I know earlier you were telling me that you are going to be working on a project for your business. And yes. so if you'll let our our listeners know, like, what yeah. we so I, yeah, I'm working on an ebook that's going to come out. It's going to be geared towards, um, engaged couples and hopefully hope to have it out in the spring. Um, I'm getting, I'm kind of keeping the topic a little close to the vest at the moment, but, um, I'm in like the research phases. I've hired a marketing consultant to like, kind of help me get this out there. Um, so yeah, I'm super excited. It's, you know, this year kind of going in, I was like, okay, I've, I've got the wedding thing down. Like I got, I get a good number of referrals and like incoming clients and stuff. And so I really want to sort of figure out how to level up in the business. And so I've taken on a few different projects. So like I've been focusing more on doing national speaking engagements this year. So like doing podcasts like yours. And then I just came back Earlier this week, I spoke at the NACE Experience Conference in Palm Springs. Yeah. Um, I've been doing that. Um, I've got the ebook. And then the other sort of random thing that I've added is um, there is a clothing company based in Boston called Johnny Cupcakes. And oh, I despite, love him. Despite the name, they do not sell cupcakes, even though so many people are like utterly confused about that. Yeah. Um, but I was brought onto their team as a cake dealer. And so I host pop-up shops for them in New York city and in New Jersey, like once a month or so. So that's been like a fun addition. I tell people the easiest way to think about it is like that they're like one of my clients. And so I plan events for them. It just so happens that like, I'm also selling their merch and stuff at the pop-up shops. Yeah. So that's been fun. So those are kind of like the things that I've been working on this year, in addition to just like the usual wedding work. Yeah. Have you heard um, Johnny Cupcake speak? I have. Yeah. So I watched his (laughs) TED talk. I've not seen him live. Okay. Uh, But yeah, I actually got to meet him. So I was in Boston last week and got to go visit the, um, the warehouse and the office and he was there and I didn't expect him to be there. So like I saw him and I was like a little bit starstruck. (laughs) <laughs> but he's super nice, like really down to earth, just like chill, normal guy. So um, that was a fun little treat. Yeah, I saw him speak. I met him a couple of years ago at GroCo at a conference, mm-hmm. and I just loved his spin on everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he like showed us pictures of how these people stand in these crazy lines. It's oh like, yeah. Get a certain t shirt or something. He's like, you got to create urgency, you got to create an experience. Yeah, it's all about uniqueness. And I mean, he was so on point. Yeah, and, um, he's got amazing ideas. But yeah, they did. They just did a pop up in London where they released some just like unique exclusive designs just for that. Yeah. And um, one of them I really, really, really wanted. And one of my best friends lives in, in London. And I told her about it. And I was like, hey, do you think you could go stop by and just like pick up the shirt for me? Well, she calls me and FaceTimes me and shows me this line of like, hundreds of people um yeah. in line to get up to the pop-up in London and she's like what is she's like what I mean and I had a feeling that like it could be crowded but she's like what on earth is this why are there people waiting in line for like t-shirts but they're his like loyal fans are just mm-hmm. die hard it's fantastic yep it is, um, it's so much fun. Like what, what they do. That's so awesome that you do. Yeah. That. That's so fun. Yeah. I actually, um, looked at your Instagram and I just saw the little, what, I don't know. It's like a little blue. Oh, the little Yeti. The, yes. the, 
abominable snowman guy. Yes. That yeah. is so cute. Yeah. So I did a pop-up um, at an ice cream shop a couple weekends ago and the Yeti is their like mascot. And so when I was talking with them, I was like, do you, would you guys be cool with me putting a little Johnny cupcake shirt on your mascot? And they were, and it came out so fantastic. And I'm actually, I've been meaning to email the owner because, um, so Johnny cupcakes actually does custom t-shirt collaborations with companies. Um, and I really want to pitch this ice cream shop on doing a t-shirt with the Yeti with yeah. the Johnny cupcake. Because so many people were like, is this a shirt? Because I would totally buy it. Yeah, it's so cute. It's adorable. Yeah, I love how it turned out. Yeah, like I would totally get that. Like I would wear it. I would get it for my nieces and my nephews. Because <laughs> like a girl or a boy could wear it. It's super cute. Yeah, it's super cute. Yeah. Well, tell our listeners what is the best way for them to get in touch with you and follow you. Yes. So um, my website is colorpopevents.com. I am on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest. My handle is at colorpopevents. Um, and then also if so, anybody wants to email me to chat, I'm at leah at colorpopevents.com is my email. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Yeah. Anna. Thanks for having me. It was fun chatting and sharing war stories from with a planner from another location. <laughs> Yeah. It's like, it never gets boring. Like I love talking to people. Like I could just talk to them all day long because there's so many crazy experiences we, I we've know. gone through. Yeah. Um, so I want to thank all of our audience and our listeners and be sure that you are following Weddings Unveiled and I'll talk to you guys next week. Have a great day. If you found this podcast helpful, please share it with your friends. And I'm so very grateful if you will leave a review. Be sure you are a subscriber so you never, ever miss the juicy details of Weddings Unveiled. Also, be sure that you're a part of my email list. And if not, you can sign up at AngelaProfit.com where I share valuable resources and exclusive products with only my subscribers. Before I go, I want to ask you, if you have a story or a product to share with the wedding and event industry, please let me know. To be considered as a guest on Weddings Unveiled, visit AngelaProfit.com and submit a podcast guest form. Until next time, remember to stay productive and profitable. You've been listening to Weddings Unveiled with Angela Profit. Join us next time for more insights to help you build a productive, profitable wedding or event business. For more great resources, head over to AngelaProfit.com.